good afternoon and welcome to the uh, keynote session um, today. Uh, it's my absolute privilege to introduce uh, Professor Mark uh, Hutchinson. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of uh, uh, Clinic in the School of Clinical Medicine at the University of Adelaide, uh, and he also runs a center. Um, he is the director of the Center of Excellence in Nanoscale uh, Biophotonics. Um, he spent about five years uh, in Colorado working with Linda Watkins, um, and uh, there he pioneered uh, research which uh, led to the discovery of uh, a novel um, a drug activity uh, in the immune cells in the brain. Um, and this was particularly in the context of drug dependence and uh, pain pathways. Um, so Mark is going to talk to us uh, a little bit more about um, uh, his work today, and I really look forward to the presentation. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today some of the story that we've been developing over several years now around how important uh, aspects of the brain that we've previously not acknowledged uh, in Western medicines uh, or on classic neuroscience function of uh, normal brain uh, behaviour, uh, and at the evolving role that drug action has at these sites as both a good and bad aspect of a drug response, and how perhaps we can tap into this over time to understand more about how the brain actually functions. So some disclosures, we talked previously, there were some uh, people discussing where they accept money from. I too accept money from most places, but don't uh, let that influence too much what I say. And specifically today, nothing about what I will be saying. Hopefully we're influenced by the sources of the funding that I receive. But I will today be talking about non-indicated uses of currently uh, approved and non-approved therapies. So uh, as they say, please consult the insert on the package. Four things that you can take away from today. Um, a more evolved understanding of what we consider contributes to persistent pain. And that is that, yes, absolutely, there are neuroadaptations that derive uh, hypernosusceptive consequences. But there is this previously unrecognized and exciting opportunity that there is this chronic danger signal within the body that contributes to the development, collectively, to the development of persistent pain. Um, glia are amazing, and you will understand why they are amazing by the end of today if you don't already appreciate that. But we'll also be talking about addiction and motivational changes. And again, with this idea that there is this chronic danger signal, although it is in a different anatomical com uh, compartment to that of the somatosensory uh, uh, nociceptive processing systems, it is a very, very similar phenotype to what we see in uh, addiction and pain. This persistent reward uh, that's driven either by an exogenous drug of abuse or perhaps a maladaptive behaviour. And the collection of these derive uh, an addiction or motivational uh, response change. And just to remind you, Glia are cool and you will enjoy a lot more about them in the coming years. But it is truly a start of a conversation. Um, I, there is no way I can... Uh, convey to you how exciting the glial research domain or the neuroimmune research domain has become in recent times. Um, I hope I do blow your minds and you do go back to those lectures uh, or those past communications of what you understood glia were and how, Im how little importance apparently they played to the brain and actually now how opening up our understanding of what this neuroimmune system has in normal brain functioning can contribute uh, to how we see multiple diseases uh, portrayed. But just a little bit about where I'm coming to this field uh, so you understand my biases in the communication. I'm trained as a classical neuroscientist and as a classical pharmacologist. I really like drugs that act in the brain, uh, not personally, but to research them. Um, and I'm interested in how these drugs interact with receptors within the central nervous system, theoretically, to create their effect. However, over time it's become apparent to me and many others in the field now as well that our immunology is far more complicated than we have previously appreciated. Absolutely, the peripheral immune system plays a role in host defence and protection, but there's our central immune-like cells as well and this peripheral to central communication of immunology that changes how our brain functions. Now, my slight twist on this is to then start asking questions about the drugs that we once, once thought 
acted directly in the central nervous system, could they be creating their, their pharmacological effect by indirectly modifying the peripheral or central immune-like cells to then create the change in behaviour? And so this is what we've coined as neuroimmunopharmacology. But let's start with the pain story to begin with. So here we have some very nice examples of acute pain or, or stimuli that will derive an acute pain response. Often when we start to talk to the general public, to patients, and even in some cases to clinicians, the idea that there is this mysterious on switch for turning on pain, which then of course means there's a magical off switch to turn off all pain. Now, obviously, that is not the case. The pain diagram is far more complicated than we would ever hope to communicate to a patient or the general public. But we do understand the very, very basic building blocks of how acute pain is processed. There are these very nice receptive systems in our periphery that transduce some form of a signal and translate that into an electrical impulse which is then conducted down a, a series of quite nicely characterised fibres which then in some cases leads to a neurochemical transmission event of that electrical um, signature into a secondary electrical signature, which then goes up into the brain to then be perceived as pain. Remember that anything below this brain level is simply an electrical impulse and is not pain. It is a nociceptive stimulus. Pain is only perceived in the brain and it should be always kept in the brain. And sometimes it's nice to remind your patients and your friendly clinicians that pain is supposed to be in the brain and it's okay to uh, encourage patients to realise that. Pain can then be modulated by a descending inhibitory or excitatory pathway to then change this whole cycle. Now, whilst those key fundamental steps have been very nicely characterised to uh, the cellular and subcellular uh, uh, rationalisation of who is contributing from a neuroscience perspective, if we actually go back and read René Descartes' basic description of the nociceptive response, which involved pulleys within the spinal cord, opening of valves to release spirits in the brain to then direct someone's attention to a stimulus, the basic building blocks of the nociceptive processing are exactly the same as they were 1,600 years ago, albeit fundamentally with very nice chemical and neurochemical associations with uh, these rather than spirits we're talking about neurotransmitters. But it has meant that the assumption is that we can break the somatosensory pathway down into the Descartes model of the body as a machine and it can all uh, work in isolation. But in chronic pain, this isn't the case. Because in chronic pain, we're talking about a very, very, very different problem. The problem here is that the disease does not require any selective transduction of a signal. We don't have to have a primary conduction of a signal. It can be entirely resided within the central nervous system. And unfortunately, if somebody does receive a tactile stimulus that once was non-painful, is now amplified within the central nervous system into a somatosensory nociceptive painful response. Now we do understand a lot about the neuroadaptations that occur within the central nervous system to drive this central sensitisation process. There are changes within the peripheral somatosensory system such that what was once a light touch becomes a higher uh, response. We have changes within the uh, primary to secondary uh, synapse with changes in expression of uh, neurotransmission and ion channels that exacerbate the, uh, or amplify the nociceptive signal. And we also have rewiring such that we have uh, once touch signals turning into pain signals. This is because the brain is plastic and changes. And whether you like it or not, unfortunately I am changing your brain if you remember anything that I say today. Because in order for that memory to occur, there has to have been a three-dimensional structural change, albeit at the micro scale, within your central nervous systems. But just to ram home the idea of how complex these changes are, I just want to walk you through one of uh, a study that we did a few years ago in Adelaide. Uh, with a graduate stu student, uh, Peter Grace, uh, to understand how many molecular switches are actually changing in a rodent model, the cleanest model you can do of chronic pain, uh, to, to understand how complex the human scenario is. <laughs> 
So Peter created a graded model of neuropathy. The classic model of chronic constriction injury is to, to place four chromic gut sutures around the sciatic nerve of a rat or a mouse, and this creates an increase in uh, allergenic response in these animals, so touch has become pain. However, what Peter did, given he was coming from the pharmacology side, and we love dose response curves, he wanted to ask the question at sub-maximal pain states. And all he did was modify the number of sutures that were applied around the sciatic nerve to create a graded pain response. So if you think of it in a clinical setting, this is somebody who's reporting their VAS score 10. There are some people who are reporting their VAS as 10, but a lot of people are distributed over the normal uh, uh, range, somewhere between 4 and 6, for example. These animals here represent the normal distribution of pain that we see now in, in this pain model. We took the spinal cords from these animals, we ran them on a gene chip which enabled us to look at the entire transcription of 27,000 genes across the genome, and then we ran it through some fancy bioinformatic processes to ask a very, very simple question. How many genes changed their transcription directly proportional to the amount of pain this animal was in? Not, I have this group here who is in pain and this group here who is not in pain. Tell me the significant difference between these two groups. Rather, who is aligned directly proportional to the amount of pain that the animal is in? And so what we got was a very nice distribution of 27,000 data points in a normal distribution curve. But what surprised us a lot was if we draw arbitrary lines of correlation, so the genes down here and up here have correlations greater than or less than 0.7. So pretty good drawing of that straight line. There are 600 genes out there in those tails. This means that there are 600 genes whose transcription is changing to almost directly proportional to the amount of pain these animals are in. How on earth can we expect a single pharmacological therapy to reverse 600 molecular switches to undo that pain problem? Now, I hope some of you are saying, uh-oh, there's going to be a lot of random associations here. You're just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it sticks. Is there anything organised in this 600 gene pattern? And we can ask that question by doing things like pathway analysis. And what pathway analysis says is I know that these genes are all aligned in something that goes from A to B to C to D. Are all genes A, B, C and D all up or all down and therefore implicating this specific pathway in the disease? And so what we asked was of these top genes, how many pathways can we uh, identify? And we saw about 22 pathways pulling up on this uh, analysis. But then we slightly shifted it because classically this is all that then, then gets done in bioinformatic analysis. What we then asked was how organised is this in the correlational side of our story? So we, if we take out the top 100 or 1000 genes that were most correlated with the pain model, do we still see this importance and organisation in this data set? And what we saw as we started to frame shift through this data set was that all the information in our top correlated genes was actually in the top 300 genes in that patch. And the critical thing is this is highly organised. So it's in at least 300, somewhere between 300 and 600 genes that we now know are highly orchestrated in creating this pain response that is directly proportional uh, to that pain. So that's a lot of switches that we need to try and work out what's going on. Now when we think about this from a clinical pain management perspective, we have wonderful pharmacologies and non-pharmacological therapies, don't forget those, that also uh, can target all the aspects of the classic Descartes model of uh, nociceptive processing. Except the frontline medication for the management of acute pain and opioids, such as morphine, 3,000 years old. The oldest drug we still use medicinally today. And our newest drugs are over 50 years old. This means that our numbers needed to treat uh, in chronic pain are pretty awful. And in acute pain, they're okay, but they're not one. So this draws me into the story around the opioids. Now, opioids, as I mentioned before, they are the oldest drug that we use clinically today, and they're the only drug that we currently fight wars over, apparently. 
and we've been fighting wars over them for quite some time with the old English-Chinese war way back in the day as well. Opioids come in several forms. We have the opioids or opiates from the uh, opium poppy, such as the 4-5-epoxymorphine morphine structure, but we also synthesise our own endogenous opioid structures, our endorphins, for example, and here we have this. These fantastic diverse molecules act at this receptor here, which is the mu opioid receptor, one of a class of several opioid receptors expressed without, throughout the central nervous system and throughout other parts of our body. Now, classically, when people think about opioids, they are the answer to the uh, pain switch. Of course, an opioid that is a fantastic analgesic will simply turn off this pain switch. But as I hope you realise, this is not simply a drug to switch a scenario. The other thing I'd like to remind you about is that in the case of an opioid, the opioid does not remove in acute, danger, in acute injury the presence of the chronic or the acutely presented danger signal. The injury still presents the peripheral targeting of uh, pro nociceptive pro-pain producing substances is still being generated. It is only at the central nervous system sites where we see uh, these, these uh, agents, both exogenous and endogenous, acting to reduce the pain signal. And this is where I now try and draw the line between the immunology and the opioids. And I was not the first person to ask this question uh, around what might have happened if the opioid system had been discovered by an immunologist rather than a pharmacologist. Um, this was posed back in the early 90s when people started to realise that everything that we were being told about opioids and that should have been dogma about opioids didn't necessarily add up with everything that was being seen in preclinical and clinical studies. And so we've evolved this to su suggest that perhaps we have gone on the wrong trajectory with the use and development of opioids because we haven't included an understanding of the immunological aspects of opioid action. So what do we think we know about opioids? They derive from the opium poppy. Wonderful. You can make sem semi-synthetic and fully synthetic opioids. But the classic model is that these things are all... Uh, act dependent upon their action at neuronal opioid receptors and that these receptors are stereoselective. So the very first paper that talks about stereoselectivity, it was back in the 1960s. Uh, it's the first paper where they synthesised the opioid inactive isomer of morphine, which is the plus isomer. It's entirely synthetic and that is that the minus naturally occurring isomer binds to opioid receptors and creates its effect, but the plus, yes, has no effect. It was almost lost in translation. Only the abstract was translated into English, and fortunately um, that's the case, and all of the figure legends are in English. Otherwise, I would have had to go back to my high school Japanese to find it, so that meant I wouldn't have found it. What we discovered, what they discovered back in the 60s from this study was that minus morphine, the naturally occurring morphine, causes analgesia. Nothing special there. You can see this analgesic response in this tail response in a mouse uh, quite nicely. If you dose a mouse with the, the synthetic, non-natural, unnatural form of morphine, the plus isomer, you get none of that analgesic response. So that means that the classical opioid receptor is stereoselective. The classical opioid receptor binds with high affinity, naturally occurring minus opioid isomers, but doesn't bind the unnatural plus isomer. Okay, so that's great. But does that then mean that the plus isomers have no other actions? And does it also mean that morphine has any other actions at other sites? So I challenge you to think back to your memory banks about being taught about most other drugs that are acting in the central nervous system and thinking about the range of off-target effects that you know these drugs have at higher concentrations. Tricyclics, for example, very dirty drug, etc., have lots of sites of actions. Opioids, can you think of any sites of actions that outside the classical opioid receptor that have been identified and taught broadly? Pretty much there aren't any that are taught broadly. But that doesn't mean that they don't act at other sites. It means that we just haven't necessarily investigated their activity. But also, it begs the question, do the plus isomers have any other action beyond the apparent lack of action at opioid receptors? So are opioid ligands stereoselective in their action? 
Now, if we go to figure five from this very paper in 1960, they ask this question for us, and it's been ignored for the past 50 years. Here we see minus morphine being given to these mice, and yes, it produces analgesia. However, if these animals had been given the plus isomer of morphine prior to this dose of morphine, there is a blunting of the analgesic effect in these animals. This means that not all the actions of opioids are stereoselective. The opioid receptor is stereoselective, but the ligands aren't stereoselective. How many people have prescribed codeine as an antitussive agent? Anybody willing to put up their hands? No? It's widely prescribed for an antitussive activity. The assumption is that it's acting at opioid receptors to, to diminish the, uh, the cough reflex. However, again, from this 1960s paper, coding the plus isomer, which has no opioid receptor activity or about 100,000-fold reduced affinity, is more efficacious than minus coding at producing this antitussive effect. And yet, Codeine today is still prescribed for its mu opioid receptor activity as an antitussive. So pain persists, and opioids don't work as, as we once thought they did. So this has forced the literature and the, my colleagues and ourselves to start rethinking how we look at pain and opioid, uh, or pain uh, physiology, pain neuroscience, and the pharmacology of opioids. And one of the ways that we started to ask these questions way back in the day before I was in, even in science, was how do you actually know you are sick? And critically, how do your patients know that they are actually sick? Because you think about that. We have got an infection. We have got some form of an inflammatory event in the periphery. And that is creating a milieu of responses that are changing our behaviours. Your friends start annoying you. You don't feel like eating as much. The foods you once enjoyed aren't as enjoyable. You probably become photosensitive. You probably become auditory, auditorily uh, sensitive. You start to be having a depressed mood. These are very high level cognitive processes that somehow your immunology is communicating to change the function of your brain. And so this has really brought a lot of people to ask some pretty terrible scientific questions in the early days. Somehow the body, the immunology is doing something over here, the body is a garden, and we do something over here to change it miraculously. But critically, you have to have point A and point B connected. And it's only been in the past 15 to 20 years where the science questions are being asked to actually connect point A and point B. So, for example, peripheral to central immune communication is now fact. We now know that there are uh, cytokine signals, for example, inflammatory mediators that are released from inflammatory sites in the periphery that actually can go into the brain to change brain function. We know that there are peripheral sites, neuronal sites of cytokine action that will change central nervous system processing and behaviour. We also know now that there are immune cells which will go to the blood-brain barrier roll alongside the blood-brain barrier and dump their cytokine load across the endothelial wall to then change behaviour on the other side. And mysteriously, there are T-cells and multiple other types of immune cells migrating quite freely into the central nervous system. And in fact, if there was a major event here that caused you some stress and you needed to remember that, you would not be able to remember that event if we deleted all your T-cells. You need to have T-cells migrating into the hippocampus in order to remember significant stressful life events. And we don't understand yet how that is working. What happens to the brain after an, inf an infection? How many sites within the brain are changed? Well, some great work uh, by Sir Drivest's group have characterised this, and many people have looked at this now. If you simulate an infection, or an immune response in an animal, you can acutely see multiple brain changes occurring at transcriptional and neurophysiological uh, levels. So what we have here is some very basic uh, transcriptional uh, markers upregulated within one hour of endotoxin exposure in these animals, so gram-negative bacterial exposure, and we see this occurring for extended periods of time throughout multiple brain regions. Now this uh, has now been ex uh, extended beyond just bacterial uh, exposure to viral load and to vaccination. 
that when people say, oh, I've got the flu from the flu vaccine, you are allowed to hit them and say, no, you haven't, because it's virally dead. There's no way that happens. But it doesn't mean that that person is not feeling like they have the flu, because their immune response is responding as though they had their flu, and their brain isn't that clever to be able to distinguish between a viral uh, virally active and inactivated uh, uh, situation. So their brain is still responding in an illness response fashion. The mediators of these fascinating behaviours are the immune-like cells of the central nervous system, these glial cells, the other brain, the other 90% of the cells in the central nervous system. Glia, Greek for glue, uh, we once thought that this, these cells just simply held the brain together, but actually what we now understand is, no, they're not just uh, holding the brain together, they're actively controlling what's happening in the central nervous system and responding in around the minutes to tens of minutes <coughs> domain to challenges. These challenges are diverse and they are, the responses are even more diverse. These cells are perfectly positioned to change neuronal function. Now, I'm sure you remember your training of a pre- and postsynaptic neuron, and I'm sure a lecturer did something like this. 90% of the time, they were wrong. 90% of the central nervous system synapses are encapsulated by an astrocytic end foot, like this. And so we don't talk about now pre- and postsynaptic neurons in isolation. We talk about tripartite synapses. We talk about this very complex interaction between the postsynaptic and presynaptic neuron, the astrocyte end foot, and now, unfortunately, the complexity gets worse because rather than just tripartite synapses, we're talking about tetrapartite synapses with microglia coming in here as well, and pentapartite synapses with peripheral immune cells selectively migrating into certain synapses. What's important to realise is that the... Uh, the lifetime of neurotransmitters within the synapse is, can be controlled by the astrocytic end foot. So the astrocyte removes vital neurotransmitters from that synapse because of its protein expression here, but it also contributes neurotransmitters and neurotrophic factors into that synapse to change the function of that site. So therefore, we're dealing with a far more complicated brain than we'd ever, ever appreciated. The brain that was just believed to be neurons can't computationally explain what we know the power of the brain has. And yet, if we start to look at the brain as a neuroimmune organ, we're dealing with a far more complex brain that now has the potential to explain some of the complexities that our brains have. So there's a large movement at the moment to map the networks of the brain with the Human Connectome Project, for example. And we, in the glial movement, are saying, OK, thank you, President Obama for investing hundreds of millions of dollars in mapping the neurons within the central nervous system. But as Doug Fields puts, it's kind of like mapping the bike paths in Eastern Europe to just look at the world's transportation infrastructure. And clearly, Google Maps would not be doing that. They're interested in the whole picture. So shouldn't we, as neuroscientists, be interested in the other 90% of our central nervous systems? Now, I'm going to tell you today primarily about the pain and, and uh, reward stories. But the glial research has gone berserk recently around simple things like asking the question, what's the difference between a mouse brain and a human brain? Now, clearly, the mouse brain is in a mouse and the human brain is in a human. But what actually underlines the difference in size, the difference in processing complexity? You can now create chimeric animals. You can place human cells into an animal as it's developing and then see what that does. And so some fantastic researchers from University of Columbia in the US did that and asked, what happens if I put human immune cells into a mouse brain? Well, it nearly doubles in size. And if you ask these mice to remember things, you triple their memory. So the difference between a lesser brain and a greater brain may not necessarily just be its neuro, its, wire, its wiring, it may actually reside within the immunology component of the system. And the story is evolving even faster than we had appreciated. I thought, I was fantastic anatomy lecture before, that was great to learn about the different muscles connecting. There are mysteries in anatomy, even mysteries in our neuroanatomy. Entire vascular systems ignored in our brain. We have lymphatics draining from our brain, only just discovered three, uh, about eight weeks ago. 
These lymphatics is the first evidence for how the immune cells that we now know migrate into the brain may actually get out of the brain. So we don't understand as much as we should about our brains. So this has meant that once upon a time we were looking at this dichotomy between the body as a machine and the body as a garden, we now have the connectors of the slightly fuzzier understanding of the immunology of the peripheral and central immune systems to contribute to the machine operating of our bodies. And so this brings me to the pain story and the evolution that has occurred with our understanding of persistent pain. Glia are now recognised as the detectors and memory holders, rememberers, of chronic danger. And they then trigger and contribute to the neuromodulation that occurs to drive the adaptations within the central nervous system that presents as persistent pain. So this is not a new story. It's just taken a long time for the titanic of neuroscience to start turning. We've known that the central nervous system immune-like cells become reactive after a nerve injury. From 91's work, Chris Garrison's got a series of papers demonstrating astrocytic reactivity following nerve injury. And we and others have seen a healthy spinal cord transition to an allodynic spinal cord on the microglial standpoint as well. These immune cells become angry and they change their function. At a molecular level, we now understand that the normal synapse functions, that's great, this is the acute pain setting, but in a proportion of people, for whatever reason, they transition to the hypernoceptive maladaptive synapse and you have a lot of adaptations at the pre- and postsynaptic terminals, but many of these are driven by adaptations in the astrocytic and microglial components. Now just remember though, that most of our pharmacotherapies are targeting pre- and postsynaptic sites. They are doing nothing to what we now propose is the seat of the pathology of persistent pain. That is the neuroimmune cells which control the generation of the persistent pain problem. The beauty about viewing persistent pain in this way starts to integrate multiple diverse hits that the body receives across a lifetime to start explaining or unpacking why individuals who have had traumatic lives seem to present with complex pain problems. We know that immune cells within the central nervous system transition through multiple activation states. But unfortunately, they're not entirely elastic. They do get tired after a while and get a bit lazy and forget to transition back to their completely naive, normal, happy state. And so after repeated hits, they ratchet up their baseline reactivity such that the next time they get hit, they over-respond to a maladaptive state. And so what we're now seeing in the literature is that as you ratchet up multiple hits on the neuroimmune system, the, the presentation of pain becomes easier and the length of that persistent pain lasts longer. So this means if you imagine somebody who has had a life of experiences, stress, perhaps some sexual abuse, perhaps a profound post-traumatic stress uh, problem, perhaps an innocuous surgical event, perhaps an innocuous... Uh, uh, infection of some just uh, perfectly timed, unfortunately, with some surgery. These multiple hits can summate individually being innocuous, but for whatever reason in these individuals do summate to, to trigger the presentation of the persistent pain. And so this idea of cross-sensitisation is a very, very nice way to start unpacking the complexities of persistent pain. But up until recently, we were still dealing with this unknown bubble of what was actually driving the activation of these glial cells within the central nervous system. And it wasn't until the identification that our own bodies were deriving signals to drive this glial reactivity in a maladaptive fashion was it, uh, were we able to really start unpacking it further. And this is where the endogenous danger signals come through. So endogenous danger signals is a wonderful bucket that we tend to now put things in as scientists. Danger-associated molecular patterns. You can put lots of things in there. It's wonderful. Because that means you save your words on your abstract counts. Yeah, you've, I know, you've all done it. Um, these things are released during stress and possibly to the death of a cell. But the cell doesn't have to become necrotic. You don't have to have the full-blown craziness of a full inflammatory event. These things are released prior to that. They're priming the immune system. 
We now understand there's a range of things, heat shock proteins, uh, factors like HMGB1, um, fibronectin, there's oxidized proteins, lots of things now are in this bucket. And they are now implicated in multiple, multiple forms of persistent pain that are derived from multiple uh, triggers. But the question still remained, what was the trigger that was driving that response? And this is where my love for the innate immune system and toll-like receptors grew very rapidly. So toll-like receptors have evolved to be pattern recognition systems. Very loose, easy-going pattern recognition systems. They recognise structures from a small molecule up to macromolecules. They, the toll-like receptor 4 is best known in, in its role in the detection of um, gram-negative bacteria that contributes to uh, sepsis. But we now know within the brain that these activation of TLRs drives neuroexcitation. And they are expressed throughout the central nervous system, albeit in temporally and pathology defined times. So basally, you and I, if we don't have a lot of persistent pain or other neuro uh, traumas or problems, our microglia are primarily the sentinels for the TLRs. But very rapidly, after a disturbance in the central nervous system, we'll get these immune cells expressing TLRs. I won't bore you too much with the signaling pathways, but TLR activation is complex and we don't understand it fully. It tends to drive a pro-inflammatory cytokine response, but it is very complicated. The beautiful thing about TLRs, though, is that they're able to be activated by this range of molecules. So as I mentioned, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, that leads to an immune response. We also have this danger-associated molecular patterns, so endogenous substances. I should also point out we're now understanding there's the microbial-associated molecular patterns, our own friendly foe who are inside us that we want. They are contributing and forming our immunology through this pathway. And then there's this fascinating opportunity for xenobiotics, foreign small molecules, to activate the innate immune system. The relevance to pain was first discovered by Joyce DeLeo's group and soon after we were able to demonstrate the pharmacological benefit of this. What we now understand is that if you have a toll-like receptor for knockout animal, it is not detecting the danger signals following a nerve injury and these animals do not present with as profound allodynia as a wild-type control. They also don't present with the hyperalgesia associated with this injury. And we were able to demonstrate that if you have an animal that's otherwise intact and you come in with a TLR blocker, you're able to acutely reverse that allodynic state. But it starts to get nice and complicated because TLR signalling is really annoying as a pharmacologist because it seems to pair up with all sorts of other things. And we were able to work with a fantastic clinician, Paul Rowland, who has a lot of experience in hurting people professionally because he is a pain researcher, a clinical pain researcher. And Paul has a wonderful tool called capsaicin that he injects into healthy volunteers to create pain. Red hot chili peppers under the skin. It really hurts. But we wanted to ask the question, if we tinker with the immunology of this model, do we actually make this worse? Do we turn a neuronal-only stimulus into a neuroimmune stimulus? Do we get a more representative pain presentation? And what was exciting was, being in Australia with the wonderful TGA and their flexibility, we were able to directly translate a preclinical model of TLR4 sensitization by capsaicin, by TRIP-V1, take an animal model and put it straight into the clinic. So here we see you co-incubate co TLR4 agonist with uh, capsaicin-induced response and you get a bigger capsaicin response on the, um, with the calcium or with CGRP release. So we took that into, into healthy controls and we injected people with low-dose entotoxin, lower than is uh, currently allowed in FDA and TGA allow, uh, approved saline packs. Um, you, have, you can actually get TGA and FDA approved endotoxin because Somebody needs to be able to test if things are endotoxin uh, contaminated. So we gave that to people, and in a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study, we injected them with capsaicin. And um, here in the dotted line is their capsaicin response on their allodynia, hyperalgesia, their reporting on the VAS, and the flare response. And in the black line is their endotoxin-potentiated capsaicin response. 
and I hope you can see that we're getting very nice exaggeration in allodynia, hyperalgesia, how much they report the pain actually hurts, and critically, in a quantifiable, uh, purely non-subjective measure of how much flare the person has on their skin resulting from the capsaicin. So we believe this model here is going to be a significant advancement in our understanding of clinical chronic pain because rather than just tinkering with the neuroscience, we're tinkling with both the neuro and the immune. But then it starts to ask questions around, well, how far can we stretch this? Are there models where we can actually say we actually already have a two-hit hypothesis built into somebody? And the female condition of chronic pain is a very nice example. We've known that the estrogen neurosteroids are associated with higher rates of persistent pain. And this goes right back to if you look at persistent pain across uh, the development of uh, the sexual uh, organs through to men who have become transsexual and gone on to hormone therapy present with exaggerated pain, all related to these sex neurosteroids. So a fantastic graduate student, Lauren Nakotra, did a wonderful series of projects to ask the question, is there a glial consequence for having estrogen hanging around? And the hypothesis she had was that something about 17 beta estradiol primed glia to over-respond to these mysterious danger signals subsequently, such that they would over-respond with a pro-inflammatory response in the central nervous system and drive heightened nociception on the somatosensory uh, system. And so we generated we used Peter Grace's graded model of neuropathy. So here we have the increasing amount of nerve injury, and here's the gradually increasing stiffness of hair uh, that we stimulate the hind core of these uh, mice with. And what you can see here is that as we do more and more to the nerve, and we stimulate more and more um, with stiffer hairs, the animals respond more and more. But to the same stimulus, the girls, these female uh, mice, are responding much more than the males. If we then break down the points in the cycle when these tests occurred, we could see a cycle effect. And it was around the proestrous and diestrous phases where the pain responses in these animals was heightened. This then led us to ask the question, if we start asking the questions directly of the neuroimmunology of these systems, can we actually reverse pain more in females than males if we use a neuroimmune targeted agent? And the answer is yes. If we take a drug, a drug that blocks TLR4 or an anti-inflammatory cytokine and we give that at increasing doses in males and females, you can see the girls come from higher baselines and come down to nearly at the boy level. And if we look at the pharmacological calculations of this, these drugs are much more potent in girls than they are in boys. But if you swap the girls to become boys and the boys to become girls, can you actually maintain this female neurosteroid phenotype? And the answer is yes. If we create a female that is male by overectomizing it, or we can take a girl, a boy, and give it 17 beta estradiol, we are able to switch this neuroimmune potency of these drugs in this reversal of allodynia. But Lauren took it the next step, and she said, if I now take female microglia and put them into males, can I make a female-like pain and nothing else has changed in these animals? So she did. She took female microglia, intrathecally injected them into an otherwise naive male, then did the nerve injury and asked these animals, how much pain are you in? And what she showed was, if she took animals that were in, that were, from females that had exposure to uh, estrogen and placed those into males which were obviously estrogen naive, there was an exaggeration, exaggerated present, presentation of pain in those animals. She then went and asked which receptor is driving this, and she did it in Tolac receptor 4 knockouts and all the various partner um, associated um, receptor families, and the bottom line of the story is you have to have TLR4 and its active signaling pathways in order to drive the female transfer of persistent pain to males via their microglia. So what this means is that female pain is not the same as male pain. And it probably means that female pain won't respond to the same medications as male pain will. It means that persistent pain is very complicated and it's not simply a switch. 
And given there are 600 molecular switches that are changing, you're never going to get a system of a central nervous system to revert back to an otherwise perfect system. The danger is within the central nervous system. It's not in the periphery. And so therefore that danger signal can move quite dynamically within that central nervous system space. So this is point one. Chronic danger plus the hypernociception creates that persistent pain phenotype and glia are fundamental to all of that story. But now the slightly change of gears. Where am I going with this relating to reward, motivation and changes in behaviour? The idea that these adaptations are occurring in other sites within our central nervous systems and changing our behaviour opens up all sorts of avenues. Here we have the spinal cord of an animal that has had nerve injury. Here we have the spinal cord of an animal that has received chronic morphine. Phenotypically, under a microscope, we are not able to distinguish a neuropathic animal from an animal that has had morphine but not had any nerve injury. Just exposure, seven day exposure to chronic morphine drives this glial reactivity phenotype. We weren't the first to discover this. We're just the first to re-analyze re the old data. Eric Nessler, who's in, one of the huge people in addiction research, his group back in 93 was surveying which uh, rats they should use to do their addiction studies in. And what they observed was that the most uh, rewarding phenotype in an animal was derived from animals that had high expression of this astrocytic reactivity marker. Then if you dig a little bit deeper, you can then find multiple stories of cytokines and chemokines and astrocytes and microglia changing opioid responses. So back in 99, there was an acknowledgement that if you combined, if you chronically dosed an opioid, what did you get? You got analgesic tolerance. But if you combine that opioid with an anti-inflammatory cytokine, the, the tolerance was attenuated. If you had an animal that received a drug that blocked the, the reactivity of astrocytes, you were able to also attenuate the development of analgesic tolerance in those animals. But it came back to the question, how are these cells becoming reactive? Why are we detecting danger in this way? So here's 4, 5, epoxy, morphine and morphine. Why is that being recognised as danger? The question then arose, well, what is truly the real danger that's actually occurring here? And yes, we know that morphine has wonderful effects, but we also know that it has a very unfortunate 3-glucuronide metabolite called morphine 3-glucuronide. And this is associated with all sorts of unwanted actions of morphine. If we look at how LPS, lipopolysaccharide, interacts with the TLR4, we know what danger looks like at the nanoscale. If we now squint, and the chemists in the room, you please forgive me, I'm just trying to communicate a very complex story here. But if we look at lipopolysaccharide and we look at morphine 3-glucuronide, these parts here are the lipophilic portions, these parts here are the sugar moieties, and if we look at how this molecule interacts with TLR4, it is very, very, very similar to how this molecule interacts with TLR4. So much so, we're actually able to visualise that using computer simulations. And we can see that small molecules dock into the complex of TLR4. We're also able to ask quite complicated questions around how the protein moves when we put this small molecule in there. So most docking stimula simulations take it as though this protein is a statue and it does nothing. But molecular dynamics asks the question, how does the protein move and flex if a small molecule interacts with it? And lipopolysaccharide going into this particular portion of the activation complex of TLR4 called MD2, it's like a thumb holding the LPS in place. If we put morphine into that same spot, the same thumb comes in to close in morphine around uh, to create the activation complex. So that's all computer simulations, but unless we see it in the lab, in solution, we still don't believe things. So we've done the study where we've used morphine incubated with the protein. We've then used an antibody to pull down for morphine. We've probed to see if we see any of this MD2. And lo and behold, we do see MD2. So we're able to actually visualise morphine binding to this otherwise undiscovered site of opioid action. 
But even that wasn't enough. We needed to then demonstrate that you could get the active formation of the signaling complex of TLR4. And immunology is really annoying because you have these very complex dimers form in the receptors. And you have to have these two different types of TLR4 come together. By tagging these and incubating with morphine, we were able to demonstrate that we were actually getting this true dimerization of the active signaling complex. So, all that means that opioids, the classic, the oldest drug we are still using medicinally today, going back to those first studies saying that opioids act at opioid receptors, that's awesome, but they're also having off-target effects at TLR4. And that's actually having a behavioural consequence. That behavioural consequence is driving an increase in the opioid reward processes, and we can see that by giving training rats to self-administer remifentanil. If we then block TLR4 in these animals, they stop pressing the bar for remifentanil, but they still keep pressing for sugar tablets, so don't worry, they're still enjoying life. We can condition mice to like uh, oxycodone. Interestingly, we can't condition our mice to like morphine. Just a little tidbit out there. Not a fan of oxycodone. Um, oxycodone, the mice love it. However, our knockout animals won't remember, won't like the, 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 uh, the, the drug as much. And then if we ask of the neurochemistry in the central nervous system, what's happening to dopamine release within the nucleus accumbens? If we give an animal morphine, they love it, we get dopamine release, but if we block TLR4, if we block the glial reactivity, the dopamine release induced by uh, the uh, morphine is blunted. But this is all occurring when the analgesic response of morphine is actually potentiated. And I'll touch on that right at the very end, because we're only selectively taking out the unwanted actions and we're enabling the wanted actions. But it's not just limited to opioids, because when we took this to the National Institute on Drug Addiction, they said, well, here's a heap of money to go and try all these other drugs that people have used. Top of the li their list was cocaine. If we do the same studies as I showed you before, and we give cocaine to rats and ask them how much dopamine is released, and then we block the TLR4, we get a blunting of the cocaine-induced dopamine release within the nucleus accumbens, and these animals forget how to reinstate their addiction. Alcohol. You'll be all going to a wonderful dinner where I'm sure there's a little bit of grog consumed. Why do you enjoy alcohol? It appears to be a glially dependent TLR4 interaction that drives this rewarding process even with alcohol. It may be the metabolite of alcohol, but it doesn't matter too much at the end of the day. Alcohol requires glial engagement and the engagement of the innate immune system in the brain. So, the, so NIDA are very excited about this and have sponsored a series of trials with some of the drugs that we developed early in the day and some of those were around Ibutilast, which is owned independent of me by a company called Medicine Nova. And Medicine Nova have now demonstrated efficacy of Ibutilast in opioid withdrawal and methamphetamine withdrawal. So this opens up a huge opportunity for understanding addictions, cross-sensitisation of addictions with life stresses. Because we have situations where people who have an addiction have chronic inflammatory events because of chronic infections, for example. But these people also experience a lot of life stress. And there's now evidence of behaviourally associated molecular patterns being generated to drive acute innate immune responses in the brain. But getting back to the point that I raised just before, how is it that I'm saying in one moment that the opioid action at TLR4 is bad and is driving an increase in opioid reward and addiction, but at the same time I'm saying it's driving increased analgesia? That doesn't make sense. Except if you look at it from the purely, no, the purely neuronal processing perspective. In order to perceive pain, you have to have increased rates of firing of neurons. In order to have increased reward and motivation experience, you have to have increased experience of neuronal firing in fundamentally different anatomical locations. So what we're saying is that opioids come in, they activate the inhibitory pathways, the, they inhibit the activation, and they try to turn down the pain response. But TLR4 comes in and says, no, thank you. Glia come in and say, whoops, wrong way, and start pushing the pro-inflammatory response to crank up that system. That means you've got TLR4 opposition of analgesia. 
At the same time, the opioids are going into the, the reward processes and inhibiting inhibition and, and causing the triggering of activation of reward processes, which drives reward, and the glia go, yippee, let's keep going in that same direction. And that's why we're getting the exacerbation of the response, driven in a TLR4-dependent fashion. It all comes down to the fact that the brain is plastic and changes. And the immunology of the brain is positioned perfectly to drive and facilitate this transition. And in the last minute, I promise, I'm waiting for the ding. Ding, ding. Why has it taken me this long and you this long to hear about this fascinating, I hope, interesting story? And it comes down to the fact that we have not had the tools to be able to ask the questions at the right time in the right place of these immune-like cells. And so that's why I'm really excited about the work that we're doing now in the Centre for Nanoscale Biophotonics, because we do have these wonderful tools, there's a tick there, that says, yes, we can look at the neurophysiology of the immune cells, but we have no ability to look at the immune-like cells of the central nervous system. So the ARC, federal government, private industry, academic institutions around Australia and around the world, over 100 researchers have got together and said, we need to create brand new tools. And we're going to use tools that actually use light to create these sensing, pro uh, 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 sensing modalities. We are forcing together physicists and biologists to work together. And this, seriously, my life is sometimes like Big Bang Theory. Because I have the physicists not understanding what it's like to have a mouse running around in a lab. They don't understand that animals turn around and their fibres might get snapped, their fibre optics might get snapped. But likewise, having a biologist who comes from a wet lab to work in a dry lab, purely theoretical lab, the power of computation has opened the opportunities in biology. So we are doing amazing things like we are creating nanoparticles, the smaller than, D, smaller than the cell, so we can go and interrogate DNA. We have particles that are able to be uh, functionalised onto the surface of very special fibres that enable us to sense. And of course, we can place these fibres into locations that are very small, that are very delicate, and come in with light to sense out things, which provides a huge opportunity to do things both in the preclinical setting, and of course, because we're ARC funded, we will only do that work, but our commercial partners are very interested in translating this out into the clinical domain. So I hope you can understand why I'm excited about my current research and the future of the, the centre for creating new sensing modalities. But there's been a lot of people that have contributed to that and a lot of different funding bodies who have also captured the excitement as well. Um, I hope I've triggered you to go away and think about the immunology of the central nervous system, to think about why it is that the brain is remembering things that it probably shouldn't, and how we can intervene in new ways to benefit our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I think we all have uh, a newfound respect for the, um, for the DL cells in the, in the CNS. Um, questions? Um, it's becoming more and more clear that the gut microbiome has a very strong and profound impact on the immune system and also on the brain. My question, uh, two questions. One, in germ-free mice, do you have altered reward and pain sensation? And the second question leading from that is, would a targeted diet influence the gut microbiome and hence reward and pain? So if we could convince the funding agencies to let us do those studies, we would see very different responses, I believe, in the microbiome-free uh, rodents. It's not normal, and that's the important thing. Yes, there are very good ev evidence now that altering the gut microbiome will change behaviour. Yes, there's very good influence you could do that by diet, or by introducing our ancient friendly foe, as in some helmets, back in. Uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, Stacey Bilbo, has just had a very large uh, paper published from Duke demonstrating that if you introduce a modified tapeworm into uh, developing pups, you are able to modify the brain structures and behaviour in a good way because those friendly foe 
are creating an anti-inflammatory response in the gut, which is creating an anti-inflammatory response in the brain and building resilience. It's very uh, binary at the moment, this field, because we can go one way and do one thing good for one discipline, and it doesn't necessarily do good things for other disciplines. Uh, and so until we understand how we can beneficially target and manipulate the gut microbiome to do these things, it's going to be a little bit of time before we roll it out big time in clinic. But experimentally, we need to unpack that. <laughs> Great. This is a very simple question. I'm just wondering with this T, uh, TLR4, is there, uh, first of all, do you think that the effect then on women is reduced post um, menopause? Um, one would assume so. And also the effect of age, do you think there's more TNF, TN, what, what I'm TLR4. TLR4 around in youngsters, which would um, perhaps, perhaps make them more uh, prone to addiction? Right. So. The female postmenopausal story, we believe, we haven't modelled that yet in the rodents, and we have studies ongoing at the moment that hopefully will get NHMRC funding this year, uh, that are going to look at those questions. The, uh, the prevalence of persistent pain diminishes after menopause, postmenopausally. And so if this hypothesis is correct, we should see a diminishment of the glial reactivity. Age, interestingly, is complicated because in the aged brain, we actually see TLR4 priming. And this is where uh, I tell you a wonderful story about glia, but then there are the clamping down processes of the neuronal system that are still at play. And so in, in the early adolescence, we have a lack of impulsivity control and hence the wiring systems to say that is not a good idea. That the, the overlap between a reactive glial state, the neurodevelopmental consequences of impulse control, and all of that need to be unpacked. Uh, but my guess is that actually the adolescent scenario is going to be more about impulse control than it is about uh, the glial story. However, if that individual has early life exposure to a drug of abuse, Long life exposure means they're going to be very hard to treat later in life. Any other questions? All right, um, we might uh, just end by thanking Mark for Thank coming you. down all the way from Adelaide. Thank you.